Welcome to My Morning Cup, a podcast produced by Costa Media Advisors, a strategic communications company. My Morning Cup, where we have interesting conversations with genuine people. I'm Mike Costa, your host. My guest this week is Tracy Wood. Tracy is the former CEO of Hospice of Chattanooga, a Leo Health System. When Aaliyah was sold, Tracy helped to create Journey Health Foundation, whose focus is on building strong community partnerships, supporting remarkable local leaders, and using data to effectively confront health care disparities. Tracy, welcome to My Morning Cup. Before we talk about how using data can help make Chattanooga one of the healthiest cities in America, let me ask, what's in your morning cup? Well, thank you first for having me on your podcast. I oh, my am pleasure. thrilled to be here. My morning cup is interesting. I like to brew my coffee at home, typically some Dunkin'. Sometimes my husband gets some Folgers. So uh, we're old school over here. Does he here. get in trouble getting Folgers? <laughs> you prefer the Dunkin'? I prefer the Dunkin', but I love them, so I let them pass. <laughs> and then I like to add a little hot chocolate to it. And then all year round, I'm so happy that they sell peppermint <laughs> mocha in the grocery store at Publix. And so I grab me some of that and put it in my coffee every morning. Now, is that because you like the taste or you love Christmas? A little of both, probably. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. I love Christmas. I love this time of year. Christmas yeah. is my favorite holiday for sure. Yeah, absolutely. The, putting uh, hot chocolate in your coffee, my wife does that trick. It tastes so good. Well, and the only problem with her, and I know she'll eventually listen to this, is she uses enough to where the spoon can stand straight up. <laughs> <laughs> My kind of I'm girl. only kidding, honey. <laughs> <laughs> My kind of girl. I love yeah. it. Well, welcome. I'm so thrilled you're here. And we've talked a little bit about, you know, what we do on the podcast, talk about folks' careers. So we're going to start at the beginning. You were born in Hampton, Virginia, or grew up in Hampton? I was born in Hampton, Virginia, and I grew up there. Um, my mother was a school teacher, and my dad worked for the naval base. He worked for the government, and he was a welder. And so we grew up in that Tidewater, Tidewater area, yeah. Yeah, very transient military area. But, you know, I had a wonderful childhood, great memories there. Siblings? I have one. Yeah. Yeah, my brother, he's an engineer. He lives in Atlanta. So you're growing up in the Tidewater area. You're there your whole life, and it's time to go to college. Where do you go? New York. Oh, well, of course. <laughs> Who doesn't go from Tidewater to New York? <laughs> So, of course, you know, my mother was not a fan, but I was very... Are you the oldest? No, I'm no. the youngest. I'm the oh, baby. You, even better, so that nest is going to be very empty, and you're all the way in New York. I'm all nice the way move. in New York. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, my mother was very strict when we were growing up. My dad was more the laid-back, easygoing. We need to have that balance in the household, for sure. Yeah. But in my mind, I was like, I'm going far away from here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, my... Um, my aunt, she lived in New York. She lived in the Bronx. And so I selected Fordham, and that was like the bargaining pieces that I had my aunt right up the street. So you get to New York. What's your college experience like? Oh, my gosh. Total culture shock. Mm -hmm. But I learned so much. I met so many interesting people. That's probably my first real taste with diversity because there's so many different people there. Yeah. So... You know, learn to eat more than meat and potatoes. Yeah. You know, it was like I got to have different cuisines. What, and what was the unexpected so uh, favorite that you walked away from uh, Marymount and said, I really like this? Oh, gosh. I walked away being a hamburger and French fry girl <laughs> from the grill. <laughs> but you tried other things. <laughs> but I tried other things for sure. Yeah, you could take the girl out of Tidewater, but you can't take uh, the Tidewater. Yeah, out of yeah. The girl. <laughs> that was my favorite. <laughs> got to go with what you know. So you get to college and you say, you know what I want to do when I graduate? I want to run a hospice. No, that's not what <laughs> happened. That is absolutely not what happened. I wanted to be a psychologist. Really? Yes. I wanted to be a psychologist. And so I was like dead set on it. You know, initially growing up, I wanted to be a pediatrician. But when I got to college, I wanted to be a psychologist. And Why was that? I, I'm fascinated by people and behaviors. So that was like just my thing, right? And so I was sitting in psychology class one day and one of my doormates, she's taking the class and she says, 
what's your major? She said, I'm taking this as an elective. What's your major? And I said, oh, you know, I'm majoring in psychology. She was like, girl, you're not going to eat when you get out of school. <laughs> and you do like burgers and french fries, so come on. Right. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I'm not. She said, yeah, you know, psychologists really don't make no money. And I was like, they don't? I said, well, they make a good, I think they'll make a good living. And I said, you know, the future says we're going to really need psychologists. Mm -hmm. Now look at today, right? Yeah. And so... She said, mm, you better major in business. So I like basically ran to the registrar's office to see what I needed to do to have a double major. So was this a friend or just someone you met in class? Well, she was a friend. Yeah, yeah we became friends. She was in the dorm with me and yeah. we became friends, but we had never had that conversation before. So and what that's, did she major in? She yeah. majored in business. And so she now has her own you know, company that she runs, yeah. but was more of a marketing executive when she first started out. So you had a psychology business major? Yes. I bet that was difficult. Well, you know, I just kind of substituted all of my electives for mm -hmm. business classes. And so then it just left me a few. Statistics was the hardest by far. I was yeah. like, oh, my gosh, am I going to make it through this? <laughs> so how did your interest in psychology help you with business? After school, I think it did. In school, I yeah, they're, like, they're why am I doing theory. this? Yeah. Yes. But I really feel like I've learned to relate to people a lot more. You know, I think um, people are still my passion. That's probably how I ended up going this healthcare path, which I never planned. Well, let's talk about that. You're in college and you get out, you got a dual degree, psychology and business. What's your first job? My very first real job after college was an accountant. An accountant? I hated every minute of it. <laughs> <laughs> I hated every minute of it because you're so, like, isolated. Yeah. At a desk, by yourself, you in numbers. And you, and you <laughs> like people. And I like people. So the silence, like, everybody in the department is quiet. Nobody's oh. talking. I was like, I've got to get out of here. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm with you. So, but the good news is it was at a school district. And mm -hmm. so then it was like, now you got to learn fund accounting. And I was like, oh. Did your business degree have enough accounting that that was a natural progression for you? Or I kind of fell into that. Yeah, which a lot of people do. You know, you get out of school and you go, what am I going to do? And yeah. someone offers a job and you go, well, okay, yeah, I'll tackle this. This is it. This is my new job. So then it's like, okay, not like I'm struggling with accounting, right? Yeah. And then it's like, oh, now you got to learn fund accounting because you got to work in the grants department. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I then ended up getting a job, leaving the school system, getting a job at the hospital as an accountant. And so that's kind of how... That was your door into the healthcare profession? You know, I did some healthcare working like as a aid or answering the phone and stuff like that in college for New York Medical Group, which is like the hip center. So I had been around healthcare, but never thought that that was going to be my career. Yeah. Yeah. I want to go back to something I know about you because I failed to ask about it, but it, your very, very first job, McDonald's? McDonald's. Was that a high school job? It was. What did you get out of that? What did you learn that you look back today and you go, you know what? They taught me some great lessons. Well, you have to learn to listen. Yeah. And you kind of have to anticipate because I ended up working in the drive through Oh, wow. And, you know, the line was long and we had to get orders out. So. And people get frustrated if yes. you're not. Yes. So you have to kind of anticipate. You need to have all of your condiments prepared so if people ask for them when they're at the window, you can kind of grab them. So organization, mm -hmm. listening, certainly having some empathy because people have bad days and they can take it out on the drive through Particularly when they're hangry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for yeah. sure. So I think great lessons learned. I see McDonald's in some locations, it doesn't seem like they've figured out the shake machine yet, like the ice cream <laughs> machine. The ice cream <laughs> machine is always broke after a certain time. That's because when I worked there, we used to take it down to clean it. Yeah. And so, of course, if you were like late in that line and we had taken out the machine, you ain't getting right. Mm -mm. <laughs> How important do you think it is for 
a teenager to have a job like that, to do something in addition to just school and extracurriculars? I think it's really important. I think it teaches kids a lot about responsibility, interacting with the outside world. You can get so used to your bubble, right? And so your bubble is your family and your school. And if, even if it's extracurriculars, it's still kind of a bubble. You don't really get a lot of forward-facing interaction as a student. So absolutely, and it, it teaches you accountability, responsibility, you know, hey, and it feels good to not to have to ask your parents if I can buy a shirt this week. You know who it feels better to? The parents. The parents. <laughs> <laughs> You got your own money. Yeah, <laughs> isn't that great? So you you got out of the out of the school system and you get into your first healthcare job and you get in through the accounting department, right? Yes. And how long were you in accounting in, in the hospital before you moved to something else? Um, I don't remember. It probably wasn't that long. Mm-hmm. I would choose to forget that part of my life unless we were talking about. It right well, now. and where is this? What city? I was in New York. Oh, you were in New York doing all this? Yes, I was still in New York. So when I graduated, I did not immediately leave New York. I stayed in New York probably 10 or 12 years after I graduated. Oh, wow. Yeah, so at that point, I was in the city. Living in the city and working in the city? Yeah. As I've always said about New York, you got to be really young or really rich to live there. (laughs) Right, really young and don't care. Yeah. So you were in New York 12 years at the hospital. What's next? So... I got married, had my daughter, my oldest daughter, and we moved back to Virginia and still sort of in finance, in the healthcare setting, because I ended up being the chief financial officer for a skilled nursing facility group. Well, that's kind of in finance. Being the chief financial officer, I'd say so. Yeah. Was it your passion? You know... I have to tell you that my career has been opportunities that have been offered or doors that have been opened, opened. not necessarily me saying, hey, I want to do this. You know, we talk to a lot of people about their careers and 90, 95 percent, very similar, say, I did not go out with the intention of being a financial person in the healthcare system, but this job came my way. I did the best I could, then this door opened. Yes. And so that's how I got the chief financial officer job is because the door opened and the uh, CEO came to me and said, hey, I think this is a great opportunity for you and I think you'd be great. And I'm like, will I? (laughs) <laughs> Were you at that company at the time uh, working in finance or did they recruit you in? They recruited me in. That's how I left New York and went to Virginia, went back to Virginia. For how long? I lived in the Richmond area for four years. And then uh, me and a wonderful friend who now is like my sister I never had. She's she's a nurse, and we decided that we wanted to open our own hospice company. So that's how I got into hospice. Was that just something you guys sitting and talking, okay, we've got expertise in this, and how do you choose hospice? Because I would imagine that's a difficult job. She worked in hospice. Okay. She was a nurse originally at the facility. She was over quality at the facility that I was the CFO. Mm -hmm. So we used to talk a lot about reimbursement and she used to code and things like that. So that's really how we began our relationship. And I had gone to Atlanta to visit with my brother and I came back and I was like, wow, you know, I really think I want to move to Atlanta. And she was like, okay, well, we'll move too. And so I said, okay, I got to find a new job because this job is here. So I then started doing compliance for another healthcare company. That's right around the time when Enron was happening and, you know, everybody had to have all these internal controls and all of that. And when I started doing compliance to move, this company had skilled nursing, assisted living, home health, hospice, and home care, private duty home care services. So initially, you could kind of pick 
which area you wanted to do. And so initially, of course, I learned all areas and then no one wanted to do hospice. Yeah. And so I was like, well, I'll do hospice. To me, it was like easy peasy, right? And the stories were very intriguing yeah. when you would read them. And so then she became a hospice nurse. Then we started saying, hey, we think we can do this. And that's how we decided to open a hospice. Because it sounds like you had a lot of the back end stuff in particular, yes. the, the compliance and the reporting and all that stuff. And your partner had the practical hands-on hospice experience. Yes. And how long ago was that when you're doing it? So we started the hospice back in 2006, and we sold it in 2012. Oh, great. Yes. And so it was wonderful. You know, now in the metro Atlanta area, there are hundreds of hospices. When we started in the state of Georgia, we were probably hospice number 90-something. That's what I was going to ask you. It seems that today there's a lot of hospice where— I'm thinking back 15, 20 years ago, they were few and far between. And define what hospice does. And here's where I'm coming from. Most people don't, well, most people, no one has a need for hospice until you need hospice. And I think the only thing we hear right now is Jimmy Carter's been in hospice for, or on hospice for a year now. Right. And when people hear hospice, it's like, okay, they got days or, or a week to live. Right. I think Jimmy Carter is a, I am happy that he's, he's living this life on hospice services mm -hmm. because there's so many myths about hospice. People think, hey, if you get on hospice today, you're going to die tomorrow. Well, and that's kind of where I'm coming from. Yeah. So knock down some of those myths. Yeah. So that is not the case. You know, you have to, by government regulations, you have to have a life expectancy of six months or less. So that doesn't mean that you only have six months to live. We don't get to choose that. But, you know, if your disease carries its natural progression and your doctor feels like it's six months or less, then, you know, you can have hospice services. And hospice services provide so much wonderful support. You know, it's amazing. Patients that are on hospice actually live longer than patients that don't have hospice because you're getting that extra quality, high quality care in your home. You have a nurse visiting you. Every week at minimum, you got nurses, you know, CNAs and spiritual care. So it's lots of support. Is it like a monitoring thing? You know, we know you have a terminal illness or you're not expected to live after six months. So we're going to make you as comfortable as possible and just make sure this last part of your journey is. Outstanding. That's exactly what it is. It is everything. Our goal in hospice care is to make dreams come true have life as comfortable as possible, enjoy your time with your family, reconnect with family. We help people find family that they may have been estranged with. It's so many beautiful stories that we see happen. But, you know, you, there is a IDG uh, interdisciplinary group meeting every two weeks where the group comes together and talk about the patient, the medical director, and the rest of the team. Mm -hmm and really think about what is best for this patient. And we have some patients that graduate from hospice that say, we don't, you, we don't need it. Yeah, you're fine. Yeah. That's an interesting way to put that, graduate from hospice. Yeah, yeah. What I'm getting out of this is hospice really helps the individual put a cap on their story yes. under their terms. Yes. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. I bet you hear some great stories from people who are in your care and, and get to know them and or something about them. That was the great thing about Hospice of Chattanooga. So many families have been impacted by the organization in great ways. And, you know, we've always go out with the intention of making sure that that visit is perfect. Yeah. Because we don't get a chance to do it twice. Great point. How did you get to Chattanooga? Were you recruited by Hospice of Chattanooga? Yeah. So, you know, a friend of mine reached out to me and she said, you know, Hospice of Chattanooga is looking for a CEO. And at this time, I had sold my company and another hospice entrepreneur had reached out to me a year or so after and was like, hey, I really need somebody to help me in Georgia. Would you consider it? So I was the vice president for him. He later sold his company. And so I was still kind of hanging out with that company. And she called and she's like, Hospice of Chattanooga is looking for a CEO. And I think 
you should apply. I think you'd be perfect. So I was like, okay, you know. So I applied and went through the process. It was board of directors at Hospice of Chattanooga. You know, they, it was a long process. They really wanted to get the right person. So probably the longest interview process I ever had in my life. It was six months long. Six months? <laughs> six months long. My goodness. So, um, Interestingly enough, I was actually down in Savannah with my daughter, my oldest daughter, and uh, the recruiter calls, and he's like, well, the search is over, you know. <laughs> like, is it? Yeah. <laughs> and so um, I got the offer, and we came to Chattanooga in 2016. 2016, 20, yeah. Yeah, I love Chattanooga. Do you? Yes. So, you know, it's interesting when we made the – switch when we sold Hospice of Chattanooga to the new company, the thought of leaving Chattanooga or doing something that did not allow me to have the relationships with all of them. We have some wonderful people in Chattanooga. We do. We do. A lot of the people I talk to say the same thing. And I experienced it myself and, and having to go work out of town for a while. So did you have relationships like that in your other stops, like in Atlanta? Not like Chattanooga. Yeah. You know, I have great relationships, and I lived in Atlanta for 12 years yeah, ago. it's a long and time. It's a long time, and I have great relationships and wonderful friends, and, you know, we visit each other. They come up, we come down. But it's something about Chattanooga. Yeah, there's something in the water. Yes, it is. It, you can't really put your finger on it. It's just relationships that you build they, I mean, I don't know what it is. In my opinion, it's easier to connect. It is. And what I found when I came here, I came here uh, 2000, is that everyone is very welcoming from the standpoint of, oh, you want to get involved and you're willing to work? Come on in, yes. water's warm. Yes. And if you're willing to put yourself out there, people open up their arms and before you know it, doors open and yes. opportunities come your way. Yes. That is one of the most beautiful things about this area. And I, I tried to um, recruit my daughter, my oldest daughter, to come live in Chattanooga. I'm, I'm still working on it. Well, you know, I'm working on getting mine back. I got one in Austin and one who's traipsing around the West. And it's like, yeah, Chattanooga's a great town. And, yeah. Oh, yeah, we know it's a great town, but that's home. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe eventually they'll get over this way. So you got to hospice of Chattanooga. Take us through getting there and then the decision to sell and what you're doing now. Yeah. Um, so initially, you know, when I arrived at hospice of Chattanooga, we probably were taking care of like 350 patients and uh, we had some challenges from a financial standpoint that we needed to overcome. And so really I went out on a listening tour and talk to all of our referral sources, hospitals, talk to our employees, what, you know, wanted to know what could we do better, what were we good at, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then what are our opportunities? And so then really sat down and looked at our competitors in the market. What are they doing better than what we're doing and how can we potentially do it? Because, you know, we were a community-based hospice, not-for-profit, really the community, it's, it's the community's hospice. Mm -hmm. So, we should be meeting and excelling every point there is around hospice care. And so really took that information and then took that attitude back to our employees that we are the community's hospice. We are the best. We should not be missing the mark in any way. And I tell you, the group of people that served at the Hospice of Chattanooga love Hospice of Chattanooga. It's got to be a real passion because that's hard work. Yes, you're giving people some quality of life, but it always ends the same way. Yes, and they have to know how to process that yeah. and know how to carry that. So we offered support services around that. But you know what I loved most about Hospice of Chattanooga? It was a family. Yeah. And so, you know, the same atmosphere and the energy around Chattanooga, the city, was in Hospice of Chattanooga. So there was almost, there was an energy. And so they took care of each other. How much did your interest in psychology and your 
your uh, degree in psychology help you, particularly when by the time you get to CEO of something like a hospice? Because I would imagine that's got to be critical to helping you through all of your stops. Oh, yeah. You know, I love psychology, too. So I would say I think every leader should take some time to invest in learning some aspects of psychology more than psychology 101 that Mm -hmm. we all have to take, you know, because it allows you to be very empathetic. And in order to serve people, I feel like as a CEO, I'm really a servant, you know. Servant leader. And in order to serve people, you have to kind of understand where they're coming from. And everybody's story is so different. And everybody has a story. Well, and you said a word that I think is critical is empathetic. And that seems to be what's missing a lot today, particularly when it comes to uh, political discussions or anything. We get too two sided and never see the middle there. Yes. Everybody wants their story to be heard. And I think that that has really grown since the pandemic. Yeah. And I don't know if it's because we had alone time, Mm -hmm. right? And so it feels like now everybody wants their story to be heard and not necessarily thinking about how the other person may feel. Yeah, that's a great point. So I understand where it's all coming from, but we got to get back to the middle. We got to get back to understanding that we are here not only for ourselves, but we're here for other people. And it's bigger than just the people that we are immediately connected to. Yeah. And life's not a competition. Right. (laughs) Right. So to get back to hospice, um, you go through your listening tour, you make the changes, hospice is going on. What brings the decision to sell? So we had an unsolicited offer. Oh, that's a good offer. Yes. (laughs) Yes. And so we talked about, you know, should we take this offer? Should we, you know, go to market? If we're going to consider selling, should we go to market? And so we wanted to do our due diligence. So we had the offer evaluated and the offer was outstanding. And so we sat with it over a few months, really went through a due diligence process and said, okay, when Hospice of Chattanooga was started in the early 80s, it was a group of volunteers that came together and said, we don't have hospice services in our community. There's no one here providing it. And so they came together and created Hospice of Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. This is a wonderful opportunity for us to take these funds and look at our community and bridge a gap. Yeah. And the bridge of the gap is the Journey Health Foundation. And talk a little bit about what the goal of that organization is and what you want to accomplish. Journey Health Foundation vision is for Chattanooga to be one of the healthiest cities in America. We know that we are lagging from a health perspective. You looked at me when you said that. (laughs) (laughs) It's so funny because, you know, we look around and, um, And we're like, look at our lives and think about how we can certainly improve them. And so I started this morning with that by looking in the mirror. So I want you to know (laughs) that you're not alone. (laughs) So, you know, one of the ways we have a lot of foundations in town, a few, and then we have tons of nonprofits in town. And we're all trying to do really good work. And we are. We are moving the needle in so many areas. But we really need to be find a neutral convener to bring together all of our data from across the county and say, let's look at our health care outcomes, our housing outcomes. Let's look at where there are food deserts, where there's food insecurity. Let's look at all of our social determinants of health. Let's look at all of the opportunities that we have from a health perspective. Where are there gaps? Where do we need to maybe expand services? And when we look at this, we have data that's kind of segmented. So, you know, everybody has a little bit of data here, a little bit of data there. So what we like to do is really work on bringing all of that data together so we can look from a 30,000-foot view and say, oh, there's the short building. There's the tall building. We're doing great there. But, oh, my gosh, there's no building right there. Yeah. 
we need to build a building here. So you're aggregating all the data from the various sources within the county. That is our goal. Because all those things like food deserts and lack of affordable housing, all those things contribute to health. All of them. And I think that we don't think about that. And that's what social determinants of health is. Like we're looking at all the housing factors, all of your health care risk, all of the jobs, transportation, all of your day-to-day activity, really your environment, really feeds into your overall health. How long have y'all been doing this now? So Hospice of Chattanooga was sold in 2021. And so we are now just getting to really nailing down how we want to bring this data together. So we are working with several organizations in the community and looking at different models that have happened in other mm-hmm. in other states and really working to bring it all together. Our goal is to bring in insurance data, Medicare data, Medicaid data, so we can have a true picture of Chattanooga. Got a couple more questions for you. What's been the acceptance from the community and from those you need that information from of this venture? Oh, my gosh. Everybody is so excited. That is the wonderful thing about Chattanooga. Yeah. Right. That's one thing that we all agree on. Right. Yeah. We all want to be healthier. Yeah. <laughs> that That's the one. No matter how healthy we are, the person always wants to be a little healthier. A little healthier. Right. And we do know that we can't go at this alone. You know, it's going to require all of our partners and people that we haven't met yet. Right. Mm-hmm. And so. Our goal as Journey Health Foundation is to be neutral because we know our nonprofit world, there is some overlap. And, you know, we don't want to get into the politics of that. We want to make sure that we are very focused, laser focused on creating this healthier Chattanooga. And so know that there are organizations that don't know about us yet, but we're going to need their data, too. Yeah. It really comes from everywhere, doesn't it? We need everybody to participate. How would you grade Chattanooga on an overall healthy scale? How healthy is Chattanooga? Is it an A? Is it a B? Is it a C? Well, considering that we have one of the lowest life expectancies in the U.S. That is shocking, isn't it? It is shocking. I say we have some work to do. Yeah. Where is it realistic? to go in the next year? So, you know, I had a meeting a couple of weeks ago uh, with the Heart Association, Mm -hmm. and we've had a increase in heart disease in our community. I didn't know that. And so the data that they have is pre-vaccine, COVID vaccine data, and if we had this increase. And so I think that if we could work on bringing heart disease, like bringing that more into line, like blood pressure, diabetes, if we could create a little bit more health around that, I think that would help us move the needle. Because heart disease still remains the number one killer. It is. And a lot of heart disease is from our appetites. I mean, we We like stuff that ain't good for us. (laughs) That coffee with that hot chocolate and not a good start. (laughs) And the cream, not good. Well, see, I think that's acceptable. (laughs) That's going to be okay. We'll let you get away with that one. Well, it really sounds as though what you're trying to do is going to benefit Chattanooga for decades to come. That's our goal. And, you know, we want Chattanooga to look different. Wouldn't it be wonderful to see us in the top 10 of yeah. life expectancy? So that's that's where we want to get. Well, and I sing Chattanooga's praises all the time. And what I tend to do, I think, is what a lot of us do because we love living here. And we turn a blind eye to things like what you just said, that our life expectancy is behind the rest of the country. Oh, my God, I need to move because I <laughs> 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 no, we're going to make it check out anytime soon. <laughs> right, we're going to make it better. So. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. And I'm glad you're here making it better. I'm going to ask you the last question. You've probably heard this before. So think back to your 25 year old self. What would you tell yourself is important for a happy life? So don't let fear get in the way. You got to take some risk. You took a big risk going from Tidewater to New York. I mean, yes. that, that, you gotta that could take, be pretty fearful. Yeah, you got to. Take some risk. 
but don't take the risk. This don't kill yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> calculated risk. But calculated <laughs> risk. Um, and you know what I would say to my twenty five year old self is, I would listen more to my parents. You know what? Every parent says that. Yes. <laughs> no, we, yes. But, but it's hard when you're 25. Yeah. It's hard to listen yeah. to your parents. You Absolutely. Know? You know, we naturally listen to our friends. Yeah. Because they know more than we do. But my parents, both of my parents had really high standards, morals, and values. And so I was fortunate enough to have that in my life. And I have that now because of them. But I think... Um, Neither one of my parents, uh, my parents are very, very conservative. So neither one of them are risky. So they thought I was a little crazy. Yeah. But I think once they saw that, hey, she's going to do this, I think they had some good advice. Yeah. It's hard for whether it's teenagers on to listen to their parents. And parents, we all just want what's best for them. Yeah. That's a universal thing. Yeah. And I think that kids need to realize that earlier. And let me just say this before we go. Now, I might be saying that because I have a 29-year-old daughter who doesn't listen to me very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, our kids are about the same age, so I, I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I appreciate this. This was wonderful. Yeah. Well, I've really enjoyed getting to know you, Tracy. Yeah, likewise. This was a lot of fun. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to My Morning Cup, a podcast by Costa Media Advisors. If you liked this episode, please share it with a friend. I release a new episode each week, so be sure to subscribe on Spotify, Apple, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts.